three, two, one. Pretty cool, right? Welcome to day four of the Global Learning Week. I'm Maceo, a fourth grader from Atlanta in the United States, and I'll be your host for today's event. Ahem. Right, right. I mean, I'm one of your hosts for today's event. I'd like to introduce my co-host and sis. Hi everyone, I'm Grace and I'm in third grade at MMS Jones Elementary School. Today we're talking about all the cool things you can do in Minecraft. Now don't get me wrong, the event's been nice so far, but since we're in charge, how do I say this? Things are gonna be way more fun. Exactly, because when it comes to Minecraft, make code, and hacking STEM, Kids are the experts. We're going to hear from lots of students and teachers getting creative during remote learning. I can't wait! Are you ready? I was born ready, and before you. Maceo! Let's start with our friend Bridget, a drama teacher from New Zealand who's doing some amazing things in Minecraft. Good idea! Hi. Hello. My name is Bridget. I am a senior school drama teacher from the far north of New Zealand. I teach in a beautiful place called Kerry Kerry, and this is my classroom. Welcome. You're going to see that the walls behind have handprints of all the students I've taught in my time that I've been here. I teach not only drama, but I'm also lucky to teach a subject which we call in New Zealand performing arts technology. So I do all the backstage work. So we make masks, we build sets, we do makeup, we do everything that's connected to working as a production. We work very much in regards to collaboration because that's how the theatre works and we very much have other stakeholders who we have to involve in what we're doing. So that's the place where we're at. And when we went into lockdown, we had two productions on the go. One we call Rock Week. So we work with the music department and we work with bands and we work with sound and we create a whole week which we merch. And it's all about bringing rock and all our rock bands at school to the school and having live performances. And we were working on our major school production, which is with my senior students, which is a really well-known New Zealand piece of theatre. It's political theatre and it's about poverty. And so we had two productions on the go. And I had two production teams which involved directors and designers, lighting, set construction teams, and also outside influence as well. Now, I didn't want to stop what we were doing because not only are the arts so important for the heart of the school, they're also important for my students' credits. So we continued working at home. So we're all behind our own computer screens like we are now, and we were having production meetings. Now, when we came to collaborate and talk about what the set was like, we had a real problem because students were working in a 2D way. They could share their drawings and they could share their screens, but it really lost the ability for them to have some form of spatial awareness. And even though we were talking face-to-face -face via Teams, we just didn't have that. We call it in New Zealand, um, aroha. We didn't have the love that was going on. So I had to think about what I needed to do. And it occurred to me that I could use Minecraft. I'd never really considered using it with my design students. These guys are putting together portfolios and they're going off to university or design schools. And I always thought that maybe Minecraft was a little bit too blocky. But when we were in lockdown, I didn't have too many choices. And I know that the Minecraft Education Edition was free and that students could download it. And I also knew that they love Minecraft. They've always loved it. I have a son who's in the same year level. And so I know that they've grown up with using it. And so there was no extra teaching that I had to do. So I suggested it to them. And the excitement from my 18-year-old boy set designers was astronomical. So we've got that playfulness back. We got the ability to um, be childish and be inventive, something that perhaps they'd lost when they'd been in lockdown. So what they did is working with the old blueprints of our school auditorium, they were able to scale. They worked on one block to 50 centimeters or two blocks to a meter. And so they were able to collaborate and create an auditorium. When we came to our first full production meeting, when they had their scale models in Minecraft, they were able to share them with their screen to the group. 
and the group were able to look around it, to work through it and move around it. So see what it looked like from the audience's point of view. They could see what it looked like from an actor's point of view. You'll see that the performance of Children in a Poor has scaffolding that uses stairs that goes up two meters. And so the ability to connect with the actors and show them what two meters looks like, what they could see looking down to the audience, which would really help them in their spatial awareness of their characterization. Also, I was able to share that work with the professional scaffolders, and so they were able to look at what the design that designers wanted and reference it into a scaffolding way. So it became really useful, not just in our school community, but also outside. For me, it's truly equitable, so all my students have access to it. Number two, I didn't have to teach them anything. They already knew how to use it. In fact, they taught me which was even better. Number three, it was super safe. So there was no worries about them hurting themselves, cutting themselves, any of that sort of stuff. And there was no worries of anything happening that I couldn't control. For me, I learned heaps. And the idea that they can teach me and that I'm not the expert, which has caused some wonderful equity in our classroom and sharing of different ideas. And for me, handing over control is wonderful because it means that the students have agency and then when it's their work, it's the best it can possibly be. Stepping outside of the square and being brave and embracing those blocks has been amazing. Honestly, if you were thinking about it and thought, yeah, you know what, Minecraft doesn't have a place in my classroom, I need you to rethink that. I'm going to be using this all the time. It's revolutionized and excited me in a way that I didn't think that Minecraft could. It is the bomb. So, be brave. Give it a chance, give it a try, and see how Minecraft can change or evolve what you do in your classroom. Goodbye, have a great day. Hi everyone, my name is Mafuza Rahman and I'm a hybrid teacher, digital lead learner and assistant curriculum leader of science in the Toronto District School Board. I really feel passionate of empowering my students to be, understand that they are change makers and can be change makers even at the young age that they are, as, but also see themselves as producers of content uh, and knowledge and not just being consumers. So in that vein of creating and producing, I was seeing a lot of amazing stuff through my different professional networks of what was happening in Minecraft education and wanted to know more and learn about it and see how I could bring it into my um, classroom and into my science curriculum. But realizing that I'm a beginner and then having hold my students realizing I wasn't I wouldn't be the only one that's a beginner I had a few students that were also a beginner like me that where can we go where beginners and experts could come together and what an uh, assignment that they can all thrive in we got to talking and uh, we came upon the idea of a first small project being let's have them design a cell in Minecraft I explained this to my students and it piqued their interest, which was really great to see, um, but they didn't fully believe me until we started actually having to pl map out and plan out our cell on papers. So what was really nice to see is in terms of my students um, taking ownership of their learning and um, taking a uh, feeling empowered that we had students who were stepping up who uh, in the traditional um, class format or traditional assignment wouldn't necessarily be stepping up and supporting their peers or um, getting engaged and involved with this assignment. So that was really nice to see. I also, as a teacher, was able to see them collaborating, um, taking on leadership, uh, their creativity, as well as um, critical thinking in a space that they were most comfortable in and that was authentic to them. What was really empowering for my students in this project was not only that they got to bring in something from a different aspect of their um, life, if they were into Minecraft, or give them an experience, but to see their teacher as a lifelong learner. So they hear us as educators say this, but they never actually see us do it. And in that space and time, they got to see me continuing my learning and with them, but also from them. 
many of you who are hearing this might think, okay, she didn't like she didn't have all the answers. And that actually might be a scary space for some uh, educators to be in, to not have all the answers, to not have that teacher's resource or that answer key. Um, but I want you to be comfortable in that uncomfortability. Because if I had taken that discomfort and said, you know what, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I don't know my, uh, Minecraft in and out. I would have deprive my students of an opportunity of learning, um, deprive the students who normally don't um, engage in the traditional science lessons an opportunity to excel and show me that they actually understood, um, and also deprive myself of learning from my students. Hopefully they will use the science content that I taught them in, uh, in their future, but um, more so, I would like them to use the competencies that they were working on and developing in our class together. So leadership, their collaboration skills and communication skills, their critical thinking and computational thinking. I want them to take those competencies with them wherever they go and whichever career path they choose. And I look forward to seeing the amazing things that they accomplish in the future. Since you're all digital, I suppose it doesn't hurt for you to come on inside. Nice to meet you. I'm Jacqueline Russell. I'm the product manager for Microsoft Make Code. Uh, if you wouldn't mind taking off your shoes, thank you so much. Um, so I work at Microsoft, but I'm also a parent. And over the last couple months, a part-time homeschool teacher as well. And you know, before this, I had a huge amount of respect for educators. But over the past couple months, my admiration has gone through the roof. I don't know how you all do it. Come on inside. Um, can I get you something to drink? Uh, some water, juice, something stronger maybe? No? You brought your own? All right. Go ahead and have a seat and maybe we can chat for a little bit. With MakeCode, we're focused on computing education and finding ways to bring computer science to life for all students. Now, to help me show you how we do that, let me invite my helpers over here. All right, you guys want to say hi to all the teachers watching? Hi! Hi! And uh, can you introduce yourselves? My name is Cyan Russell. Mm -hmm. What grade are you in, Cyan? Fourth. Okay. And my name is Sage, and I'm in second. Okay, great. And you guys have been helping me do some computer science projects over the past couple months at home, right? Yep. Okay, so maybe um, you wouldn't mind sharing some of the projects that you guys have been doing? Okay. Okay, you want to start, Cyan? Yep. And tell everyone uh, what projects you've been doing at home. I have been doing <coughs> Minecraft Education Edition. And in Minecraft Education Edition, you can code. So press C on your keyboard to code. Mm -hmm. And if you see, and on the home page, there's all these different like tutorials you can do. Okay. Uh, what if what can you show us an example of a project you've been doing? Okay. Well, I did a tutorial of a project. Mm -hmm. I did um, aquarium. Okay. Which I did right here. Okay. Which is right here. Oh wow. So basically, what does this code do? This code makes it so that when I use a trident, okay, it'll it'll make like a glass tank. So this is the block that makes the glass tank. Yep, filled okay. with water. Oh, okay. And so this is the water. It fills yep. it up with water. And then what happens? And then... It um, looks like it's in some sort of block. What does this do? This will make it so that whatever's inside will will happen four times. Oh, it'll, it'll repeat, right? Yeah. That's a loop. So I'm spawning in a tropical fish, mm -hmm. um, a puffer fish, and puffer fish, salmon, and salmon. Okay, four times. Four times, so and four then, of each. And then I'm also placing purple coral. Okay. Um, yellow coral. This is horn coral. Hor okay. Horn co coral and fire coral. Love it. And what do these do? These pick random position. That'll like basically what it says, pick a random position oh. from a certain point to, 
to a certain point. Okay, That's so the, within that. Yeah. Okay. Within that area. It'll and what do these numbers position. mean? Those numbers are basically like the point. So basically mm. like point A to point B. Like the coordinates. Yeah. Right. In sort of 3D coordinates in the game, right? Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And then what's this one last block down here? Um, I want I wanted to spawn an a squid. Oh, one single squid. So it's yeah. not in the repeat loop. Okay. Great. All right. So um, now, how if we want to actually run this code, how do we how do we do that in the game? Press the play button at the end. Oh, okay. And it'll go red, and okay. it'll go. It'll You'll be automate. in your game. Yep. And so. I said okay. swing of a trident, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna swing my trident. Okay, oh wow, this is very cool. Look at these uh, fish, you got fish and squid. All right, how do we get, can we go inside the aquarium? Okay, I'll show you I how. Don't know how. How do we do that? Okay, Mom so. taught me how to play Minecraft, I've ricocheted off of there and now. Yeah, now you're like a super Minecraft expert. Oh, you're breaking the glass. Oh my goodness, look, we're swimming inside the aquarium Here's that we built. Here's how you swim. Wow, look at the coral and the puffer fish. This is very cool. And we've got some squid here. Nice. All right, so as well as coding in Minecraft, because I know you could play Minecraft all day long, um, can you show us what other um, stuff that you've been coding? So this is Arcade. It's mm -hmm. basically where you can code your own video game. Oh, cool. So, and this is the, you just open up it in the browser, arcade.makecode.com. Yep. And what's on the homepage here? Uh, again, the same things, just a bunch of, um, bunch of tutorials. Mm-hmm. And can you show us kind of what you've been doing here? I, I did, I have been doing this thing called free throw. Oh, okay. It's a free throw game, like a basketball free throw game? Yep. Can you explain to us um, how you coded this? Okay, so I set the background image mm. to this basketball court that I drew. Cool. And I set my sprite to the to this cat. Mm-hmm. And, and then you set this cat, it looks like it's going back and forth here. Yeah, because I That's... set my sprite to go back and forth. Okay. And before it just went straight across and it just kept going off the screen. Kept going off the screen, that's no good. And so I did this bounce, and so I put this bounce on wall block. Nice. <clears throat> and then I, s I made this basketball hoop. Nice. And then I coded also, I also coded a basketball. Basketball, wow, very cool. This looks like a beautiful basketball. You drew this? Yeah. I love it. Very cool, and so if I press any button now, looks like basketballs come out from my player. Yep. Great, and then what's this last part of the code? So basically, if my sprite, sh sprite sh shoots a basketball, mm -hmm. and it hits, it the overlaps, yeah. The basketball hoop, then it's game over and you win. Hooray! Okay, so let's see if we can try and play this game. Um, okay, I'm, let's see, I'm not very good here. Here, me. So, may what's I? the, yeah, go ahead and tell me what's the, um, what's the strategy? Try and shoot, shoot it right Whoa. before the three, first three one. Throw. The or just oh the purple line here yeah okay. or just keep sh shooting over and over again nice that sounds great um and then i noticed that there's this download button here yeah. what is this you can download you can download them into like there's a bunch of different places that you can download them okay but my, what but one of them is the meow bit i oh, love great. meow bits they're so cute and then and then once you download it, you can turn it on. Yeah. And then it automatically goes to your game. Oh, I love it. So, and then I can just um, play my game here. I can shoot baskets. Yeah. Very nice. This looks like a lot of fun. Um, cool. Well, thank you so much for, for showing us some of those projects that you've been working on. Um, Sage, did you want to come and show some of the projects that you're doing? You gave this to me for Mother's Day, didn't you? Yeah. Um, an electronic bouquet. Yeah. 
Oh, and it makes music too. When you make when you make loud noises. Oh wow! Very cool. Can you tell us um, wh what is this uh, electronic component here that you used? Uh, this is a micro bit. Uh, it's not a micro bit. I mean, although we, we have used <laughs> a lot of playground. yeah, we we have used a lot of the micro bits as well, right? But this is a circuit playground express that we've been coding. This wasn't for any holiday. Mm -hmm. What it is was this? Just, uh, it was like a frog. Oh, it's a frog, is, and this is the tongue here. Yeah, this is a tongue. Okay. And it looks like you've hooked up some uh, oh. servo motors. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Continuous servo motors. Okay, so, and how does this work? On circuit playgrounds, uh, there are buttons A and B. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to press buttons, the two buttons A, mm -hmm. and see what this does. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, and <laughs> to stop it, you have to press buttons B. Oh, okay. B stops it. Uh, nice. Where is that? Okay. <laughs> this one. Yeah. No. This one. Okay. And this one. Great. All right. Well, that's a cool uh, project. You want to show us how you coded this? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. How I coded this. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, the code for this. So this was also uh, a make code, right? Yeah. So, and let's see, how did you hear in uh, makecode.adafruit.com? Can you tell us a little bit about um, these blocks that you used? Well, I go to input. Mm-hmm. And. You use these button you clicks. You use right? on button A. Okay. But you can turn it into a. Uh, you can turn it into button B. Oh, okay. Uh, buttons A and B. Mm-hmm. And this Very is how cool. you uh, delete it. And then what are these other blocks? Uh, the this one mm -hmm. is light. Okay. So. Set all uh, pixels to a certain color. Yep. Yeah. Set so all that's why the lights red. turned red or or white. yeah or green. And then these are how you activate the the yeah. start and stop of your continuous servos. Uh, yep, they're under the pins. Pins. Mm -hmm. Uh, great. Analog set. No. Yeah. Analog. Yeah, that right was, pin. Yeah, that was to turn one. it off, right? This one. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks so much for showing us uh, some of your projects, Sage. That was very helpful. Over the last couple months, the Make Code team has been hard at work compiling a bunch of online resources uh, for parents, students, and teachers uh, learning at home. So if you go to makecode.com slash online dash learning uh, to get to our online learning page, you'll find all of those resources here. Um, you can watch our Mixer channel where we do have daily and weekly uh, live streaming videos where kids can interact with us, uh, code along with us, and we also have um, a large library of videos available on our YouTube channel, um, including our Make Code in the Kitchen videos every Friday afternoon, uh, where me and the kids will do these projects here in the kitchen. Um, there's also some online tutorials and projects available, as well as a bunch of educator resources. So we hope that's helpful for you. Uh, one last thing I also wanted to call your attention to is our Game Jam. So if you go to arcade.makecode.com slash game jam, uh, we're hosting a competition this month. Uh, the theme is garden. So um, I encourage you and your students to work on an arcade game that is themed uh, according to garden or outside or uh, summertime uh, and submit it. We do have prizes. We're gonna be giving away um, some Meow Bits, some Pie Gamers, uh, and some arcade t-shirts. Thanks so much for coming by our house and having this little chat with us. I certainly hope that what we shared was helpful. Um, do you guys have any last minute things you want to say? Thank you all the teachers out there for helping us learn and grow even in this tough time and tough situation. That's right. And thanks for teaching us um, even though it's been a rough time since COVID's here. Mm-hmm. Yep. But we've had some fun doing some fun projects at home, right? Yep. All right. Thanks so much. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. 
STEM education is so important to the Davis School District because we care not only that kids um, move into these high powered fields across the country, but that they're prepared to engage with the world, to be curious, to wonder, to make sense of things around them and to really become solid problem solvers. Um, we wanna build a community of people across our state that are, have the skills and abilities and the compassion for each other to make the world a better place. In Davis, our the structure of our STEM curriculum focuses around kind of three main indicators. We focus on wonder, sense-making, and problem-solving. And because of this, the Hacking STEM curriculum was a perfect fit for us. And so we've been analyzing our programs top to bottom K-12 and looking for areas of need. And we found an area in our junior high zone where we really needed a, a strong STEM component. And so partnering with Microsoft, we were able to offer a course at the junior high level called uh, Hacking STEM. That course uses the Microsoft lessons, um, but uses them around our framework. And so teachers engage kids in wonder, they get them making sense of the world around them and really uh, on a regular basis, getting kids engaged in creative problem solving and really thinking about, you know, what is my place in the world and what problems do I see and how what skills do I need to develop to be able to really attack those and do an amazing job with it? The Hacking STEM course is much more than just an elective class for us. It really is that opportunity for enrichment and enhancement for kids as they move towards being uh, more proficient in STEM areas. We see STEM as an instructional process and in a way that kids engage with the world, not a content area. Um, so we promote that across all of our content areas, math, language arts, science, all across the board. And it's really focused around getting kids to do those indicators of wonder, sense-making, and problem-solving. And our course that we've been able to offer that's had a huge success at, the, at our school levels where all of our sections have filled up really has been able to be that avenue for kids to dive deep into this and to really see their full potential when it comes to their ability in STEM areas. During the soft closure, our district had to take a hard look at really what are the most valuable things to be working on um, at home and remotely. And when it came down to um, some of our core areas, especially in our STEM areas, and definitely with this uh, hacking STEM class, we identified that you know the most important thing is to not follow scripted um, standards and curriculum, but to have kids focus on wonder, sense making, and problem solving, and really engage with the world around them. And the hacking STEM class had been building those skills so solidly with their students that as they left and went remote, they were able to um, continue that work. They had the skills and abilities for teachers to be able to reach out to them with projects and, and with problems to solve and then be able to do those things at home and then uh, post those back to the community of people from the Hacking STEM class and really share what they've been doing at home in terms of problem solving. It was uh, pretty beautiful to see. In order to make the Hacking STEM class work, <clears throat> teachers needed to get a lot of background knowledge in terms of how to do circuitry, and use all the tools and really dive into the projects. And so we partnered with Microsoft and, and we had a Microsoft representative come down. We spent three full days really just diving into projects and how they work and focusing on the projects from, like I uh, mentioned before, from our indicators of wonder, sense-making and problem solving. That's really what we looked at over those three days is how are these projects getting kids um, working together and creatively solving problems? And once you've done the project, how can you take it further? That was the other big thing that we worked with teachers on during our training is if you've now done a Hacking STEM project, how do you hack that project and take it to the next level and really come up with your own way of doing that or apply it to a whole different scenario? And so we spent three days with teachers running through that, learning all sorts of new skills and um, really getting them prepared to help kids um, build those skills over the school year. Hi guys. Hi. Hey. Hi everyone. My name is Ankur Anand and I'm a program manager on the Hacking STEM team at Microsoft. I want to start by saying thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you on the call, to all of you watching this, for your patience, for your grit and for your frustration resistance. 
in dealing with these crazy, unprecedented times. Uh, who thought? Uh, so the goal for today is us today is to primarily um, do three things. Uh, the first one is to celebrate your resilience and your success. Uh, thank you for finishing the school year in such an awesome way. Uh, the second is to look ahead and to prepare for what's next. And finally, consider what we as a global community can learn from this year, can take from this year to redefine the future of learning. Um, today we have here with an, yeah, us yeah. an amazing group <laughs> of Florida who are doing some awesome work, especially on two fronts. The first is around modernizing and democratizing STEM education in state. And the second is around developing teacher confidence and teacher confidence um, to bring 21st century learning into the classroom. So without further ado, uh, let's start with introductions. Kathy, do you want to kick off? Sure. Hi. Thanks for bringing us here, Ankar, to share our story. I'm Kathleen Schofield. I'm the executive director of a Jacksonville, Florida nonprofit called the Northeast Florida Regional STEM2 Hub. And our mission is to help assure that all children are ready for the jobs of the future. And I am so excited to turn things over to Justin. Thank you so much, Kath, Kathleen, and uh, thank you, Ankar, of course, for, for uh, bringing us here. My name is Justin Feller. I am the Computer Science Program Specialist at the Florida Department of Education uh, within the Bureau of Standards and Instructional Support, uh, where our task is to make sure that all 150,000 of our teachers across the state are well prepared to make sure that all 2.4 million of our students are well prepared to, well, take care of the world. And I'm very excited to be here and a part of this group to tell you all about what's going on. And I'd like to pass it over to uh, my friend, David. Hello, hello everyone, I'm David Reichert. I'm CEO of Alluvion. We're a national recruiting firm headquartered in Florida. Excited about this opportunity to be here and really excited about the work that we're doing with Northeast Florida STEM Hub. Awesome, so as you might be aware, the mission of the Hacking STEM team is to modernize and democratize STEM education. We are trying to modernize STEM education by bringing hands-on 21st century skills and tucking those into current curriculum. We're not trying to change what teachers are teaching in the classroom, but we're trying to hack current curriculum and add four 21st century technical skills to current curriculum. And those four skills are mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, software engineering, and data science. And we're trying to democratize STEM education by making it affordable, affordable. by using objects that are inexpensive, that are, that are available, that are affordable uh, across the globe. All right, so let's jump right in. Kathy, I know you brought in some amazing educators from Florida to, uh, to the Microsoft campus last year. We organized a professional development and hackathon uh, on Microsoft campus, and uh, it was a pleasure having you all. And that really kick-started um, the whole hacking STEM revolution in Florida. So can you share a little bit about your experience on campus and how that experience is, is sort of leading to what we are now, where we are organizing statewide teacher professional development camps uh, for hacking stem absolutely thank you so gosh it was not even a year ago when we were on campus at microsoft learning from the hacking stem team but my journey began about six months before that i read satya nadella's book hit refresh and i learned about the hackathon and i heard about satya's vision for all students and his passion for education that they should all be able to have these incredible experiences. So I had a colleague who invited me to visit Microsoft and I spent about an hour in the hacking STEM lab and I said, I need a do-over card for every child that I ever taught because what I learned in that one hour made me know that the tools and skills that were presented there and the affordable way that all kids could get very high quality experiences that I had to find a way to bring this back to my region. And I talked with my board chair, David, who's on the call here, and we talked about what would be the value of bringing 30 educators to spend two weeks on campus at Microsoft. And what we learned in those two weeks was beyond anything that we ever could have imagined. We learned that in any classroom, regardless of your background knowledge, regardless of your prior skill set with computer science, that we could really bring strong, solid content based lessons into the classrooms that built those skills that every child needs. 
It was certainly a, a very memorable experience. And, and I remember when Kathy returned from her initial trip to Microsoft and talking about uh, what Hacking STEM could do for our, for our region. And then we really, we thought back to, you know, why were we doing the work that we were doing? You know, we were trying to, to really focus on developing the future workforce. We knew that our corporate community needed these high tech workers. And we were trying to find a way to, to build a platform, to build a system, to, to build the capacity to train our kids so or educate our kids so that they could take on these jobs that don't exist today. So uh, we quickly decided we needed to go. And uh, so quickly say yes. And uh, let's go let's go find a way to make it happen. But uh, what, I, what I thought was really interesting is how we were able to rally our corporate community and really take a little bit of that leap of faith, knowing that uh, this may be the system, systemic change that we really need needed in our community to be able to give the teachers the skills. And what was probably the most eye opening thing to me is really how special our teachers are. And the only thing really that was holding them back was giving them some more tools and affordable uh, ways to me give meaningful lessons to kids. And uh, you saw a bunch of adults in the room acting like a bunch of kids at Hacking STEM, but it was a very moving experience. And uh, I'm so grateful that we had the uh, opportunity to participate. So Justin, you lead a very large student and teacher population. You have huge responsibility there. Um, I would love from you, love to learn from you on, on how you got involved, how did, how did we connect the dots, and, and what do you think about, about Hacking STEM? Of course, for the uh, better part of the last few few years, we uh, have been working across the entire state of uh, Florida to, to make sure that everybody, be they teachers, students, uh, community leaders, parents, understand that computer science and computational thinking and STEM education as, as a whole is really key to make sure that our students are ready for those next jobs. And as Dave has met, David uh, mentioned those, those those jobs and tasks that don't currently exist. We're kind of preparing everybody to do that kind of next best thing. Um, Kathy came to us and said, listen, I've got this really exciting program that I just found out about called Microsoft Hacking STEM. And what she told us about was kind of this mixture of a makerspace approach with technology. And it brought together computational thinking and problem solving skills and hardware and software and communication and collaboration and teamwork. And not only every single thing that's on that certification exam that our teachers need to be competent with to get that scale sort of pass it, but also every single thing that we want our STEM and computer science students to be absolutely foundationally confident with. And so we designed these five day prep camps uh, where on days one and two teachers work to understand the history of computer science and the history of tech, not technology. They learn about things like the OSI model, things that mostly college level and, and uh, graduate students learn about. And so then on day three is when we really kind of jump into Java. And so if you've never seen a third grade reading teacher learning Java without having a background in it, you have not seen a brave educator. Uh, but we have a lot of them in this state. And so what's really exciting is at the end of a day when teachers are very exhausted of learning and understanding and picking up skills that they never imagined they would be able to uh, do, what do they do? They build a robotic thinker and they apply all those things that they've learned from those previous three days. And unknowingly, they prepare to, for, for those things that they're going to do for those next two days. It's kind of unintentionally turned into the glue that holds this whole uh, five days to, to together. And it's just, it, it's a very, very exciting time, not only for our teachers that are preparing for this cert exam, but for the future students that are going to be in these computer science classes with them to learn about the things that they didn't know today that they're gonna be able to do tomorrow. With the hacking STEM lessons and with the hack that the hacking STEM team did, they took data and made it become something that is real and that students can understand. And for example, when kids do a lab in science class, often they write down some numbers, they're catching some data, and then we ask them, can you chart that? Can you make that into a graph? And what we found is the children might be able to create a graph that has the components on it of maybe some bars, maybe some lines, but they don't understand what the data really says about the experiment. The beauty of the streaming tab is when I, like for instance, with the robotic hand, when I take and I move my hand and this moves, 
not only is the student able to see I moved my hand and I made something happen, but in real time on that Excel spreadsheet, they are seeing the hand moving and they're watching the data come in in real time. And I've seen it at some of the camps we've done. I've seen it when I visited classrooms. The kids will stop and then they'll do this and they're not watching their hand. They're not even watching this. They're watching that screen. So data is coming to life. And we all know that data is the currency of the 21st century. The people who can understand the data, know what it means and know how to analyze it they are going to be the kids who have the strongest skill sets for the jobs. What are your plans for this year? Well, speaking locally, as we're watching to see how the schools are planning to open, we're making our going forward plan around what the conditions are going to be. So, for example, we will be able to train teachers on how to take these inexpensive materials and make them available to the kids. It may be as simple as when they're coming in to pick up lunches. We put things in for them to take home. It may be that, we, um, that we're able to have them get a template ahead of time to just cut out and make things. And it could even be in the form of a little kit that you get at the beginning of school that you have these essential tools. You might have an Arduino board, you might have a breadboard, and you might have some wires, and they may be used over and over again all year long during any times when we're not in person in school. And um, for the summer, we've actually taken our hacking STEM camps that we did in person last year, and we're making them into a virtual version where they'll have some whole group time learning and then they'll have small group time where they'll work in teams to be able to build and make and hack some things and keep learning these skills. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you for your, thank you for your growth mindset. Thank you for your passion and thank you for your enthusiasm in, in changing the STEM landscape. I cannot, cannot wait to hack STEM with you across Florida. Thank you. Hey, those hacking STEM summer camps sound great, don't they, Grace? Yes, we gotta let Ma sign up for one of these. Good call. By the way, what is that you're working on? Oh, this will be ISTE. I think it stands for International Society Education. No technology. So close, Grace. Actually, it's the International Society for Technology in Education. But you nailed the logo, so we're all good. Hello everyone, my name is Richard Collada. I'm the CEO of ISTE. Really excited to be here with you today and be part of this uh, amazing event. In case you aren't familiar with ISTE, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. ISTE is a nonprofit education organization. We work all around the world and we're probably most known for something called the ISTE standards. And these are a framework, a guide for how to use technology effectively in learning. We believe that you can use technology in a whole bunch of different ways, but just because you're using technology doesn't mean it's good or it doesn't mean it's effective. And so the ISTE standards give a set of qualities, a set of uh, characteristics of effective technology use. Things like using technology to create and to research and to collaborate, to be good digital citizens. The ISTE standards are adopted uh, all over the world and in every state in the United States. But recently we've had uh, people come to us and say, well, we, we know what it says they're supposed to be. We, we get the words, but we wanna see what it looks like in action. What, it, what does it look like in the classroom? And so we're excited to announce that we just finished creating a series of videos. We took our video team and actually went to classrooms around the country and captured teachers in action, demonstrating the ISTE standards. And so those are all available. You can go to isti.org slash standards and you'll see those videos. One of my favorites is a teacher from Los Angeles Unified School District who was using Minecraft to teach her students about important historical landmarks around the world. They actually create a replica of the landmark in Minecraft and all along the way they're learning about the important properties of it, why it was so important and what the cultural relevance of the landmark was. 
So it's a great example and there's many more that you'll get to see. Let me share one more thing with you before I go, and that is that we are very excited that we are going to be starting something called the ISTE Summer Learning Academy. It'll start in just a couple weeks in July, and it's a program to help teachers understand how to be very effective at teaching online. So it talks about things like, how do we make sure we're creating inclusive environments in an online space? How do we make sure we're doing effective assessments in online learning, right? Not just uh, multiple choice tests that are delivered through a tool, but actually authentic portfolios and engaging assessments that we can have our, our students participate in. How do we make sure they're, they're fun and interesting when we teach in a, in a virtual space? So that activity, that virtual uh, experience, the Summer Learning Academy, will happen in July and you can get more information by going to summerlearningacademy.iste.org. And there'll be a couple special guests, a Broadway star and an American Idol winner who will be there joining us to be part of this celebration. So hope to see everybody there. That's it for me. Let's see what Mason and Grace are up to. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for coming to the best stage in the whole event. Make sure to tune in tomorrow for the last day of Global Learning Week. Even though it won't be as much fun without us, you're in good hands with Mark Spargel. He'll be talking about ways to build student-teacher relationships and support social-emotional learning. Whatever that is, whatever it is, you won't want to miss it. Hey, Maceo, before we go, you want to see who can build the coolest Minecraft house? You're on. Ready, set, don't wait up. Ugh, I always fall for that. Looks like I got this one in the bag. Hey, if you want to learn more about all the cool stuff we covered today, check out the Microsoft Education blog. Bye! Bye.